Steve the Mize Miser, how's it going my friend? Good James, how are you? Well, you know, I'm a little bit pissed off. These uh, super voting structures, these large cap companies who are U.S. multi-state operators coming and listing on the CSC with these multiple voting share structures where, you know, a couple of insiders are essentially controlling the destiny of the company and the shareholders really don't have a vote. Wasn't it you who was telling me that back in the 90s, the super voting structures were basically drummed out of town, off the market and everything. What was it about super voting structures that you money managers didn't like? Well, specifically the, the uh, relaunch of the multi-voting structure is, is uh, due to the, obviously the, in the cannabis space and that's where we're seeing the resurgence and, and it's not ideal, that's for sure. Uh, I don't know that all the multi-voting share structures were drummed out of town, but it became a big issue with corporate governance. Uh, it seemed if, if the idea of a corporation and one vote, one share structure is pure democracy in its rawest form, uh, then multi-voting is, is inappropriate. It's a dictatorship. It is. <laughs> it is. And uh, it allows uh, individuals to dilute and issue more shares without losing their control position. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the share structures were, uh, were, were uh, collapsed uh, due to shareholder vote and due to uh, institutional governance and uh, pressure from institutional shareholders. Uh, so that, that's how it, uh, that, that's how a lot of it disappeared, but it didn't all disappear. Sure. So give me an example of the most egregious form of corporate behavior in the super voting structures from a past example. Well, uh, I would say uh, Magna stands out. Uh, in the early 1990s, Magna uh, allowed uh, Mr. Stronach to control the company with less than 1% of the uh, issued equity of the company and still does to this day, to my knowledge. I think that's unfortunate. In the early 1990s, around 91, when interest rates went really high, Magna was essentially a bankrupt entity and uh, the bondholders had to do special votes and, and give special concessions to allow the company to stay in business uh, because they were in debt default. Uh, sadly, what the debt holders did is they did not insist at that time to collapse the multi-voting structure and Mr. Stronach was able to hang on and that's going back to uh, you know, 28 years ago, which is quite amazing. But that really, and that allowed uh, Mr. Stronic to go into uh, race tracks and entertainment and things that maybe uh, were outside of the uh, venue of auto parts. And uh, notwithstanding, you know, it's quite a company, but it, it doesn't seem uh, appropriate that he can control the company with really a, such a minuscule stock position. Mm -hmm. So is there a risk that the large uh, cannabis companies who are governed by these super voting structures, is there a risk that they could decide to go into horse racing too if there's some weakness in the cannabis space that spooks them and equity investors won't actually have a vote to stop that? It's true. I mean, they, they essentially have uh, dictatorial control. Uh, the two big ones that went public in the U.S. just in the last month, uh, they both ended up with about 80, between 82 and 84 percent voting equity after the issuances of at least 300 million U.S. dollars in each uh, IPO case. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, uh, the one individual or a handful of individuals control 84 percent of the stock. That's uh, that. that that, that's pretty compelling for them and, and not for shareholders. I think the uh, I think the excitement of the space and to get all those multi-state opportunities uh, allowed the uh, allowed the uh, shareholders to uh, maybe overlook that uh, structure. But but it's it's not ideal and mm -hmm. it, and it arguably is not ideal for maximum valuation in a stock. Sure. So is it your position that retail investors should stay away from super voting structures given? all other things being equal in a basket of stocks they're considering as an investment? I think it's a component of uh, consideration and, it, and it's not ideal. Now, there are uh, some major institutional businesses in 
Canada that uh, major institutional companies uh, or institutional grade companies that have multi-voting or non-voting stock structures, typically in the Canadian media space. Now, it was argued, and they were still grandfathered or accepted by the market, it was argued that that was to protect Canadian media companies from hostile foreign takeovers by American or international entities. Hmm. So companies like Rogers have uh, voting stock, which the family controls, and uh, non-voting shares. Uh, Shaw has uh, non-voting shares or sub-voting shares. And uh, that was more typical. And when McLean Hunter was public, they had X and Y shares. So there is some legacy of these uh, sub-voting stock uh, or sub-voting stock companies around in Canada, but really left over. Canadian Tire is one of the one that's most interesting because it goes back probably to the 1930s or 40s, where the Billis family uh, took the voting stock and uh, the, the the shares that trade for the. Uh, both both classes in Rogers and Canadian Tire case, they both trade, but the liquid one and the one that's widely owned uh, is the non-voting shares. Hmm. Uh, what they do offer, though, is they offer this coattail provision. I haven't looked at the uh, U.S. cannabis companies. I'm going to assume that's in there, but that's in the event of a takeover. Mm -hmm. uh, of the company that the it's called a coattail provision which should allow the non-voting shares uh, shareholders to get exactly the same price per share as the non -vote, as the voting stairs shares yeah. now Canadian Tire doesn't have that and there was a controversy some decades ago when they tried to sell the company and the price spread between the common non-voting and the super voting shares was dramatic and that uh, the deal ended up failing Mm hmm so I'm looking at the case where um, you know there so the coattail provisions do exist in the in the US operators who are Canadian listed but the weakness in the coattail provision says that just because an offer is made for the super voting class does not necessarily mean that the shareholders get to vote on the adequacy of that offer however they will be subjected to the same takeout price if the super voting holders get to actually approve the takeout offer. Yeah, I mean, each each structure is different and it'll go, it's going to be in the fine print of the prospectus. So I, I don't know specifically, but typically uh, it will be a case where management recommends to shareholders that this is fair and this is good and, and you should take it. But uh, I don't know for certain in each case, and each case may vary whether there's the privilege or the right of the uh, subordinate voting or the non-voting shareholders uh, to vote. I think the new deals that have come in the cannabis space are actually subordinate voting. So you get a vote, but there are super shares mm. that allow multitudes of votes to overwhelm and, and dilute out the uh, value of a single vote. Yeah, I don't know about you. I'm going to stick with the uh, companies without the super voting structures. But thanks, Stevie. See you later. You bet, James.